Okay, hi there. Good evening, guys. Welcome back to Not So Late Night Show. So today we're going to talk about Singapore Bank. So uh, they've just released their third quarter results. So uh, we want to take a deeper look and maybe come with uh, some sort of justifications. Uh, why has the share prices of Singaporean banks have actually uh, moved back to their historical high pre-pandemic levels, right? So you see DBS at uh, 30 plus uh, sing dollar, uh, OCBC at 11, 12 dollars, and uh, UOB at uh, 25, 26. So we'll dig deeper what has happened for 2020, what has happened in uh, first year, first half of 2021, and also uh, the latest uh, three quarters, uh, the nine months performance of all these three Singapore investors. So let's go straight into it. Uh, but before that, uh, just as a clear disclaimer, uh, whatever we share right here is just for educational purposes, uh, informational purposes does not construe you to buy, hold or sell any securities or companies mentioned. So I'll pass it to Chun Beng. Uh, bring us through a bit uh, what has happened for, for Singaporean banks and as a Malaysian, uh, what are your perspective and, and opinions? Yeah, I think uh, Japan had made a clear introduction that uh, Singapore Bank has back to the so-called historical high and even higher than uh, the pan I mean, pre-pandemic time, right? So it will be quite interesting that we should look into it, uh, whether uh, this is a sign of, sign of a strong recovery and then what is the factor behind uh, this sustainable and, and why Singapore Bank uh, can be an avenue for you to actually at least put inside the watch list uh, in the coming quarters or years, right? So uh, we just wanted to actually take a step back before we talk about the details of each bank, uh, by doing a quick introduction of our understanding on how bank can evolve uh, as we grow. So I think uh, when we are small, those things, we the first impression is the bank help to actually keep the money safe. And then because they have the capability to do so, uh, people put the money with them and then they can actually lend the money the uh, interest. So this basically set up the fundamental of uh, non-bank related uh, businesses. Uh, that they offer, you think, wow, this one comes from a bank, definitely has gone through some of the proper due diligence and so on. So for example, uh, to make this thing uh, happen, a bank need to do quite a number of checks in terms of risk management. So who are the people they should lend the money to? How much? How should they should uh, actually do it? Uh, what is the strategy that they need to put in in case uh, there is some uh, downtrend of the economic or even uptrend? Uh, and then of course, if you have all these things in place, uh, what is the interest rate you should charge so that you get enough buffer to cover the risk and also making enough margin uh, for your, I mean, for the bank itself and of course the shareholder. So all these things is about risk management, right? But then uh, it, no matter how well you manage the risk, there will be some sort of black swan event. And uh, this kind of black swan event uh, will actually impact every single sector. So even bank that is very very stable and people just put money in there uh, by default uh, will get impacted quite heavily and then i think I, I won't go through in details you can see uh dbs bank uh they are having a very bad number uh, in fy uh 20s especially on the allowance side because they have a lot of default and also bad debt and some of the initiative coming from the government to actually uh allow the lender to actually defer the payment. So all these things got impacted, not only in DBS uh, uh, bank, uh, you can see it in OCBC, uh, all, the, all the allowance on the impact asset is actually increasing. And lastly, uh, the another bank uh, that formed the top three of Singapore bank, uh, which is UOB, also see the same trend, right? But uh, if we zoom in uh, uh, nine months uh, from uh, for this 2021, uh, Actually, the, uh, the Singapore Bank in general are showing a very good uh, result. And then uh, most of it uh, can be reflected from the profit perspective. So you can see uh, DBS actually have 46% uh, profit up uh, on a year-to-year -year basis uh, for the nine months uh, uh, compared to the previous year. And then uh, all the impact, yeah, all those things has been actually uh, 
managed well. So it's a good sign. That's why the share price uh, is reflected as well. So it's quite general that it, when it happened to DBS, it's, actually, it's also reflected across the other three banks. Uh, the other two banks, which is OCBC uh, and also UOB, right? So uh, it's quite straightforward, but then uh, when people deal with unknown, uh, they tend to just sell off the, 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 the investment and then just have a proper look into it. So in this case, uh, if you uh, are scared uh, during the pandemic uh, due to a lot of unknown, then you just uh, actually sold the, 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 the share. You might actually miss some of the opportunity to grab uh, during the, the, the best time. But then, uh, nevertheless, all this thing has gone. Now it's a new 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 phase where uh, people start to actually come into recovery mode and this is something that maybe uh, you might not experience before. It's a post-pandemic kind of thing. And whether all these things uh, can be continued to actually reflect or not, later Japan will give a, a deeper share in terms of number. But then in general, you can see that net interest margin uh, is lower uh, if compared with last year, but then uh, they start to actually stabilize. So uh, no need to actually put down so many uh, net interest to actually attract uh, loans, but all these things uh, has been managed quite well from the Singapore side. Uh, most importantly, bank being bank, uh, the one of the core numbers is actually the loan. And then uh, nevertheless, loan is uh, also growing for the three banks. And then uh, this is the reason why uh, Singapore Bank are able to actually achieve a uh, historical high and then back to the pre-pandemic uh, uh, eras, if you, if you talk about the share price. But whether this thing is sustainable uh, uh, and why go with Singapore, maybe you can look look into Thailand or, or even Indonesia, uh, because people, in general, you think uh, recovery are coming soon. So we need to look deeper into how all these banks is making their money besides just the typical uh, lending activities. So maybe Japan can take over to, to share you a little bit details about the three banks from Singapore and how they are they doing differently compared to other regions. Okay, thank you, Chun So I think uh, before we wrap off the um, you know lending part, the lending business or the interest income business, you can see that uh, for the past 10 years, I plotted it out. Right, a lot have a lot has happened. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, black swan, minor, minor crashes here and there. Uh, but one thing that really uh tells the truth is that uh, no matter whether is it a good time or is it a bad time, all three Singapore banks have actually seen their loan uh, steadily improving and growing for the past ten years. So even though in twenty twenty you argue that um the allowance or the impairment provisions has actually uh, made the banks put down their uh, overall profit but if you look at just the loan growth itself is still on a growing trend and when you see coming to 2021 when everything reverse back to normal uh, you will see that uh, the profits also are swinging back up to double digits right so uh let's go to the next one which is the um yeah the, the income streams so we talk about how banks are not just purely uh, in the lending business but they also need to have some supplementary uh, ancillary kind of services. And for the Singapore banks, surprisingly, uh, the non-interest income actually are quite a big uh, contributor in terms of their income stream as well. So you can see that uh, for three banks, uh, for the nine months results, you can see that um, interest income, the one that comes from the lending business, uh, contributes to around half of it, 57% for DBS, 54 for OCBC, and 64 for UOB, they do have another strong pillar, which is the non-interest income. These are the income that are not you know, gyrated or distorted by uh, economy uh, activities, which might pressure the interest uh, rates, right? So there is another 43% for DBS, uh, 46% for OCBC and 36% for UOB, which they can continue to grow uh, irregardless of the interest margin pressure. So you can see that um, for the uh, non-interest income portion, uh, the banks are also quite, I would say, smart and, in, uh, and, and quite witty when it comes to ensuring uh, that uh, 2020, even though it was a bad year, but it was not as bad as it seemed. You can see that the contributions for 
the non-interest income has actually grown really, really well for all three banks. So for uh, UOB, you can see that previously for the nine months in 2020, the contribution uh, in terms of the non-interest income is actually uh, at around, uh, as we mentioned just now, around um, 50 plus percent. But the contribution from the uh, non-interest income has also increased significantly. Same goes to OCBC, uh, close to 40 plus and even some quarters, you can see in the first quarter of 2021, even some uh, quarters, the contribution coming from non-interest income actually can go surpass up to 51%. And for DBS, uh, which relies heavily on fee income, which is also the non-interest portion, uh, you can see that uh, is actually up. 17% con compared to the previous nine months. So uh, the banks have actually leveraged well and positioned well, strategized their game plan to actually ensure that the non interest income actually uh, delivered sublime uh, growth for this uh, 2021 versus 2020. So just to bring you guys through, if you are not too familiar uh, with the three Singapore banks and uh, their characteristics. So basically, uh, DBS is more of a corporate bank. So they are the banks that um, businesses would want to actually go through if they seek for uh, financial and whatsoever kind of uh, uh, you know borrowings that they want. And uh, it is also quite actually uh, well received and famous among the uh, retail uh, bankers as well or normal consumers as well. You can see that um, the non-interest income contribution uh, from their Wealth management is actually uh, up to 45%. So wealth management is one of the uh, good uh, key contributors for non-interest income. Then you also have uh, cards, your credit cards. So they also leverage on that. And also uh, other related uh, fees like loan related fees and also transaction service are also are the key non-interest income contributors for their fir uh, first nine months of 2021. So the next one would be um, great uh, OCBC. So you guys would be familiar uh, if you are coming from uh, Southeast Asia because they do have quite a presence in uh, Indonesia and also Malaysia as well. And they also do have uh, Great Eastern, their insurance arm, uh, which I think is also quite popular and quite well known in the Southeast Asia region. So you, when you invest into OCBC, you are also tapping onto the potential uh, returns uh, and the uh, so-called exposure to the capital markets and also the uh, insurance arm of uh, uh, OCPC, uh, which is Great Eastern. Then they also do have other contributions like the fees and commissions and also the um, trading income and also the life assurance profit as well. So uh, it really depends on what kind of a bank that you want to invest in and uh, each of them have their own strengths and, 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 and their own uh, pros. So for UOB, I would say it's a little bit more of a normal bank, uh, just that uh, when maybe you can think of it as a, a bank that uh, is growing quite well uh, uh, among Southeast Asia region. They do have quite a presence in uh, quite a lot of uh, Southeast Asia countries. Data will go through that. Uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, non interest income contributors, most of it is coming from a uh, loan and trade related and also uh, wealth management. So all three Singapore banks are quite, quite actually good in wealth management and uh, wealth management has actually picked up uh, during the COVID and has actually helped them to bolster their uh, fiscal year 2020 results. So I think one thing um, that maybe would have prevented uh, the sudden uh, fear uh, when you see Singapore banks tanking during the pandemic would be to check the uh, capital adequacy ratio. So this is actually one of the KPIs that um, helps to tell you that the banks are actually quite well protected in terms of their capital, that uh, even in uh, unwanted uh, black swan events, the bank still have, have actually have enough capital or, or all the uh, liquidity to hold a fort to ensure that uh, it does not actually uh, fall into unwanted kind of circumstances. So we will go through deeper, uh, but you can see right here, uh, the good thing is that all three Singapore banks have actually kept a very high uh, CET1 ratio. We will we'll, we'll focus more on the CET1 ratio, which is the more important one. So you can see for UOB, it has been steady for around 14%, uh, and then just coming down a bit uh, for the latest uh, three quarters, which is September, uh, down to 13.5%. So it's just roughly around 40%. And for uh, OCBC, you can see that it actually went up from 14 plus percent to 16 plus percent, and then came in, coming right down to just around 15, 15.5%. Uh, 15 and for um, DBS, it's uh, quite stable. It's just hovering around 14.5% as of the latest uh, month, September. 
So you might be wondering what is CT1 and how actually uh, focusing on this and ha- can actually give you a, 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 a kind of a reassurance that Singapore banks are actually very, very strong. So to give you a brief insight, CT or common equity tier one is a, just a, one of the components of tier one capital, uh, which is mostly con- consistent uh, of the common stocks held by the bank or the financial institution. So it's like a measurement and a, like a KPI uh, introduced in uh, 2014 as a precautionary means so that it protects the economy from a financial crisis and also protects the bank from any financial crisis. So uh, the level or the Minimum requirement set by CET1 by Basel Tree is actually 4.5% as of 2019. And remember, just now, all Singapore banks actually have a minimum of uh, at least 13.5% uh, for UOB and uh, for OCBC around 15% and for uh, DBS is around 14%. So it's 10% more than what CET1 ratio, the minimum requirement set by uh, Basel Tree. Then you come to Singapore uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is uh, MAS. So because these three banks are actually um, what we call DCIPs, which is the domestic systemic, systematic, systemically important banks. So these banks are crucial and vital to Singapore's economy and, 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 the, and the entire ecosystem of it. So they actually increase or put a higher uh, CT1 ratio, which is 6.5%. So then again, it's a higher requirement, but then again, you can still remember all three Singapore banks actually have uh, more than enough CT1 to actually ensure that they are well uh, capitalized and stay within the requirements of uh, whether Basel Tree and also uh, the money authority of uh, Singapore. So of course, if you want to read deeper, here's a link down there below. You can actually uh, go to the link and, and read more and understand more of uh, on the requirements and why is it so important to understand CT1 uh, to help justify and ensure that you know, uh, the banks that you invest in are actually safe or not. So the next one, we talk about um, geographically diversified. You can see right here, uh, I would personally think that uh, UOB is quite one of the most uh, diversified in terms, in terms of geographically. So 51% of their income come, or profit before tax comes from Singapore, but they do have a uh, presence in Greater China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and the uh, rest of the world. Uh, DBS is a little bit more skewed towards uh, Singapore, which uh, around 67% still relies on Singapore, but they do have good uh, presence in uh, Hong Kong and well Greater China and also ASEAN region as well. Then, of course, with OCBC, I think it's also similar to UOP, uh, half of it coming from Singapore, but they also have a huge presence in Greater China, Malaysia, and also Indonesia. But of course, uh, do take note that the figures for, uh, or the breakdown for DBS is actually the uh, first half 2021 results actually did not disclose the uh, complete breakdown for their latest nine months. Whereas for OCBC and UOP, it's the latest uh, nine months uh, results, which we uh, took the effort to actually split up by ratio. So I think um, at the end of the day, uh, once you actually go through uh, banking business, uh, the business model, uh, what are their key components, the key constituents, and then you assure that um, the banks are safe, then at the end of the day, it's actually what kind of returns or what returns can the banks actually provide you for being a lawyer and um, a smart sh- shareholder, right? So one aspect of it is actually the dividends. So I think most Singapore banks have actually been uh, stable, predictable uh, dividend paymaster. They pay around 40 to 50% of their net earnings in, in the form of uh, cash dividends. So it's actually a good kind of a substitute. Uh, if you think that your portfolio is too read-centric or too skewed towards read, Singapore banks are actually quite uh, predictable also in, the, in terms of their dividend payment. And um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can say that you actually would have a more diversified portfolio if you actually have some banks, uh, particularly Singapore banks, together with uh, REITs in, uh, in Singapore as well. So I think um, one of the few, I would say, good factors uh, subconsciously is actually uh, looking at how MAS um, views or, 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 or what are the latest activities they actually put in terms of uh, uh, their monetary policy on a single dollar. So you can see that uh, if you read the news, I think a few weeks back, uh, they actually tightened the single dollar policy. And um, from that, you can actually give a gauge that um, Singapore government uh, as a totality is actually uh, bullish 
or confident of a recovery and then uh, you know a lot of has happened during the pandemic um, you know in terms of um, uh, liquidity ensuring that um, uh, market or, or a lot of I mean, the entire economy does not run out of money. Uh, a lot of money has actually been uh, printed. Uh, and, and yeah, inflation is uh, coming up. And so uh, to strengthen and stabilize your, your currency, you have to actually look into retightening your uh, monetary policy. So of course, that comes as a good gauge that, um, yeah, things are should, looking, should, should be looking towards a good hit recovery. And uh, we won't go deeper on this but uh, if you are interested you can actually go to MAS also and, and read more about how Singapore uh, MAS actually controls or, or determines the uh, currency strength by actually comparing it against a basket of other currencies so that's the link if you want to read more so I think um, after you actually gone through uh, what has happened in fiscal 2020 and then uh, what has actually improved for fiscal 2021, then you have to look forward, right? Because even though banks are notoriously traditional business, but if you want to buy a bank right now or Singaporean bank right now, you also need to understand what's the prospects uh, for the near term and also the mid term. And what I see is that uh, they do have a huge emphasis in terms of their digitalization initiatives. So uh, for those who are in Singapore, you are actually quite familiar and uh, quite aware that um, Grab is quite is working quite closely with UOB. They actually come up with a strategic alliance uh, for both parties to actually grow uh, in the ASEAN region, uh, tapping on the digitalization uh, initiatives and uh, services that Grab is offering, and also UOB coming in as a financial uh, partner as well. So for the other two banks, fret not, uh, they actually team up with Google Pay uh, to allow uh, credit cards to be linked to uh, smartphones as well as smart devices so that uh, it really gives or provides um, consumers like you and me a peace of mind to pay uh, with the card uh, instead of using a card, but also pay using our smartphones and also uh, smartwatches as well. And the last but not least, I think uh, the key um, winning battle or, or the first salvo that they actually fired was to introduce pay now, uh, which actually uh, prevented the e-wallets or the small, small e-wallets from coming into Singapore. Uh, if you go to Malaysia, it's quite rampant. There are a lot of uh, e-wallets uh, in Malaysia uh, because the banks were quite slow in terms of uh, ensuring a smoothness and transaction uh, payment between peer-to-peer. -peer. So now we pay now, uh, you can actually have the contact number of your uh, someone you want to send money and then you can just send it easily without any hassle and remembering their account numbers. So I think uh, also to look forward is that how banks tr transform from their traditional business. So I have, have one, one good example here is DBS, is that um, they are looking into uh, trading common credits uh, with the uh, collaboration of uh, SGX and uh, Thermasic uh, under Climate Impact X. So they are coming out with a platform to allow uh, the trading of common credits. And the next one would be how they also embrace uh, blockchain uh, uh, by actually joining with uh, JP Morgan to come up with a blockchain payment platform. So the next one would be uh, to really uh, keep in mind that once or when you invest into a Singaporean bank, you are not just investing into a bank that has presence in Singapore, but they also have a presence outside of Singapore and a huge uh, presence as well. So I have here an example, which is uh, OCBC, uh, they have a stake in Bank of Ningpo, which is um, a bank in China. They also have a strong presence uh, in Hong Kong, OCBC, Wing Hang, and also um, in Indonesia. So for banks, uh, you might also think of them as a traditional brick and mortar. When you, whenever you want to do a banking uh, facility or activity, you need to go to the uh, brick and mortar, the actual branch. But fret not now, I think uh, one of the key um, aspects of UOB is that they are really working very hard on their banking app. Uh, you can actually do a lot and um, not just having a banking app uh, of UOB in Singapore, but um, those in Malaysia and also Thailand can also uh, tap onto the uh, ever innovating app to help uh, smoothen your transactions or whatever banking activities that you want to do. And I think that uh, they are also one of the pioneer Singaporean banks to allow a UOB card to be linked to uh, your WeChat uh, so that you can actually use WeChat Pay when you're actually in China. 
So I think once you actually, um, you know, identify what went wrong and what actually went well, and then the, the prospects of it, then I think the last thing to, to really do is to actually uh, do a key side-by-side -side comparison between the three banks. Uh, we won't do the valuation. I think it's subjective, but we actually uh, go through some valuations, which is much part of the um, performance base. So you can see that net interest margin uh, is stable, as what Jinping said just now. Um, it has already reached 1.5% uh, as, as a total average for all three banks. So DBS for 1.45, UOB uh, slightly higher at 1.56. So I would say across the board, uh, it's quite the same if you don't need pick on the small, small decimal point, right? So cost to income ratio, um, uh, the lowest one would be um, UOB at 43.8%, followed by uh, OCBC. So uh, just slightly higher also is just DBS. I think. Uh, for these both aspects, they are quite in line. And even for non-performing loan, all of them have actually controlled it quite well at 1.5%. So the one that you might actually want to nitpick would be the return of assets. The highest part here uh, would be uh, OCBC at 1.22%, followed by DBS at 1%, and uh, UOB at just slightly below 1%, which is 0.92%. And then on the return of equity side, you can see uh, DBS slightly higher, 12%, than uh, at 10% for both UOB and OCBC. So I would say among all of them, uh, they have their pros and their strengths in some aspects, but you look at it as a totality, I think all three banks are really, really, really strong. And um, if you really want to also look beyond the midterm uh, prospects and also look at the longer term, you will actually need to think um, that actually Singapore being the financial hub of Southeast Asia and also potentially uh, Asia, if uh, everything anything bad happens to Hong Kong, um, they are actually quite well situated strategically uh, in terms of the geographically and then having the access to uh, Southeast Asia and also Asia as well. So I think um, that really wraps up what we want, what we want to share compared to um, maybe other banks around in this region, which may grow faster than Singaporean banks. But in think in terms of totality, in terms of packaging, in terms of managing risk, uh, DBS really uh, not to say DBS, but Singaporean banks is really uh, at the cream of the crop lah. Right? When, when you compare it within the uh, ASEAN range, so uh, just to give you guys a snapshot. Um, Last year, these were the prices of Singaporean banks. So they were at um, quite high prices relatively, but uh, well, uh, come, come, uh, when you fast forward to one year today, uh, the prices actually go up, went up high, quite uh, higher than, than, and then, than they were one year ago. So I think uh, I'll pass it to Chumbeng. Uh, I think we do have a simple checklist on how or what to check when we invest in the bank. So I think Chumbeng also uh, briefly did a video uh, back then in our channel. So just to recap, what are the 10 basic things to check before we invest in bank? Yep, so I think uh, this is the five thing. Uh, obviously, you need to know how they actually uh, do it historically in terms of revenue and so profit. And then what is their EPS? Uh, and then on the number four one, I think uh, Japan has covered in details is how uh, stable they are uh, to actually uh, face with all the Blackstone event. And then of course, after all these things uh, is about managing costs. And if you go to the next slide, uh, it's the remaining thing that you can check before investing into a bank. For example, now you know about their bank uh, performance, bank related uh, performance, then you need to check out what is their other income stream and then whether they are skewed to a specific sector or industry, uh, which might actually bring you uh, some of the risk during some uh, economic cycle. And uh, the next is all about the typical thing that uh, we will check also when we uh, look against a normal company like the cash flow statement. But for bank itself, you can look into their MPL, which is their non-performing loan ratio. And lastly, uh, do a quick check about their valuation, their P ratio and so on. And, la and the one that you can compare uh, easily if you like bank in general, let's say from Singapore, and you might want to pick the best of the three, for example, and you need to do a P to P uh, comparison, right? So uh, this pretty much sum up uh, uh, the quick checklist about investing into a bank, and then uh, the moving on is maybe I will 
ask a question into Japan because Japan currently is based in Singapore. Uh, for non-Singaporean, uh, if you wanted to use a sentence to actually uh, describe the three bank, uh, what we will do, and then uh, whether uh, it's good to actually invest into them now, and then or what is the factor that you should take notes before investing into it. Good question. So if I were to use one sentence to, to, to describe Singapore banks, I would say that uh, Singapore banks are truly world class, right? I'm not exaggerating. Um, you can see that, um, you can maybe argue to, with me that the uh, Japan Singapore banks have just no business in Singapore and just at most uh, ASEAN region or Asia, right? Banks in the other parts of the world maybe have a higher addressable market. So you talk about banks in the US. <laughs> but um, I think when you look at um, how Singapore banks have actually been faring and actually been growing and how they actually went through the previous uh, crisis, right? When financial crisis happened, it, it hits every bank in the world. But who are the banks that are still strong right now as of today? Uh, you can count Singaporean banks as one of them, right? And also to remind you guys, uh, Singapore, uh, DBS actually is actually the world's best bank voted by the, uh, you know, uh, uh, I forgot what was the uh, body really, but uh, the, the, when it comes to uh, comparing uh, DBS against other banks from around the world, they have actually uh, been nominated as world best bank for their innovations and also for their uh, forward-looking kind of business acumen as well. Right, so that is what I would actually. Uh, describe about Singapore banks and uh, if you are not a, a Singaporean and you want to actually consider Singapore banks, I would say go for it. Definitely better uh, in terms of stability and in terms of uh, defensive compared to other banks. Right. So thanks for the questions. Uh, so if you guys are interested uh, on what Kaya Plus do, we do actually do more uh, serious or more in-depth stuff. So we actually do have a subscription package, which we call it the premium club. So it's at uh, 48 per year. Uh, we do more in-depth study and analysis on, on, on sharings and stocks, much more in detail than what we do today. And um, yeah, we also will actually come up with a uh, special thematic sharing. So the ones that happening uh, end of this month is actually a cloud company. So Castle on Clouds. So if you are interested, you can actually sign up to our premium club. So we've actually covered other topics as well, EV, Semicon, and also e-commerce. Right, so here is just a snapshot of what we will be covering uh, this coming uh, end of this month. So here is a snapshot. We won't go through the detail, but if you are interested, do check out the link to sign up as a Premium Club member. So I think that's about it for today. Uh, I hope that uh, it gives a good summary of what Singapore banks have actually achieved for the last nine months of uh, 2021. And uh, of course, maybe I'll ask Spectrum Bank, uh, would that make you consider investing uh, in a Singapore bank even though you are currently in Malaysia? Yeah, I think it's quite interesting when I look into uh, Singapore bank, especially from DBS, uh, because in Malaysia, uh, you won't know about this bank uh, unless you check them out or you visit Singapore uh, because their presence is mainly in, in, in Singapore and also Hong Kong or China. But it will be quite interesting to see how innovative they are. And uh, their non-interest income uh, is not just coming from the traditional, maybe paired up with an with a insurance company. But it can be quite forward thinking, like they wanted to do blockchain related stuff, uh, offer cryptocurrency, uh, digital exchange, uh, offer carbon credit exchange. So all these things is where uh, you can think, although their business is predictable, but they got other pillar keep on growing up. So uh, imagine the PE keep consistent, but your revenue and profit keep on going up, then that will happen, share price will go up. Lah. So yep. I think this is one turn to the Singapore bank, uh, which is good in the sense, and it can act as a very defensive stock that you can put in there and, and worry fees, uh, unless uh, if you look back into Malaysia, maybe political instability or those things might impact the banking sectors but singapore until now uh, stability is one of the main thing uh if hong kong all those things have something wrong uh by default people will go to singapore so there's a, a still a lot of room to grow yeah i think you are spot on in terms of 
not just going through the uh, sharing that we just had, but also from a geopolitical and also from a holistically point of view. So let us know in the comment section, do you think that um, Singapore banks have reached their max or they can they further go uh, from what they are right now? Let us know in the comment section. And of course, if you do have other stocks that you want us to deep dive and analyze and share, let us know in the comment section as well. But next, if there's nothing else, we will actually end our sharing right here. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and also, you know, share it to your relatives, friends, family, if they are curious about how Singapore banks will perform and uh, do actually help us to like and subscribe as well because it will help to grow the channel. So we'll see you next week in the next episode of Not So Let Me Show. Take care. Bye-bye.